uh, that is where you will put your questions in. And this session where we're hearing about the methodology, assessing disease-specific health-related unmet needs, creating the evidence base. And I'm delighted to welcome our session chair, Anne van der Broel, who is Director General of the Belgian Healthcare Knowledge Centre, KCE, to introduce this topic. Very warm welcome. Anne, great to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Jackie. And I'd like to extend the welcome uh, to you all uh, for this important session. At KCE, we really value this topic and I'd also like to thank Anami again for highlighting why we feel this topic is so important. Um, it is much broader than pharmaceuticals and I think Anami's story has illustrated this perfectly, that it is not just about drugs, but it is about much more than um, simple um, solutions. So it is an important topic and we've been working at KCE uh, on this topic for quite some years now and it was in 2016 that we published first report on medical needs and then a few years later we've published a second one on patient needs and then only last month colleagues um, published the report on patient and societal needs which is again a step further um, towards the solution. And we believe that we need independent but also very solid and reliable evidence to document these needs and to make these, um, this evidence accessible to people who may want to um, get use um, of it. For example, researchers in academia but also in industry, patient organizations, citizens at wide. So we believe that documenting the patient and societal needs is something that will be able to drive innovation towards um, meeting those patients' needs much better than we do today. And this is, I think, um, all you need to hear from me, and I would like to um, give the floor to my colleagues who will talk to, to you about the uh, content. Thank you very much indeed, Anne. And Anne will come back at the end of the session uh, just to reflect a little bit on what we've heard in the presentation. So we're going to have a series of presentations in this session to tell you more about the project, about the approach, about the methodology. Uh, then we're going to get some reactions uh, to what we have heard, uh, and then we will discuss it. And this, in this session, uh, you know, please do, if you have questions about what you are hearing, pop them in Slido and I'll squeeze in as many as I can. So, to tell us more about the NEED framework, let me bring up our first group of speakers. I'm delighted to welcome Irina Klimput, who is Scientific Programme Director at KCE. Irina, I suggest you go straight to the podium because you're going to kick us off. Also joining us, Charlene Martens de Norhut, who is Health Services Research Expert at KCE. Great to have you with us, Charlene. Make yourself comfortable. Claudia Schoenberg, medical doctor and clinical expert at KCE. A very warm welcome to you. And Isabel Hoyce, who is a professor in clinical pharmacology and pharmacotherapy at KU Leuven. A very warm welcome. They're going to hand seamlessly one to the other as they take you through uh, both the framework itself, give you some case studies, give you a sense of where we are, and then, as I say, we'll hear some reactions to that and open up for conversation. But Irina, get us underway. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie, for this introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. I am very pleased to be able to set the scene for this first scientific session, uh, which focuses on the NEED project, which is led by the KCE together with Cian Sano, and which is supported by the Belgian Federal Health Administrations and also by the Belgian Science Policy Office. So health for all, it's the stated objective of the WHO since a very long time. And I think it's quite safe to say that it's actually a shared objective by uh, healthcare policymakers, citizens, and society at large, because good health is eventually the fundament of well being and a stable society. However, despite major advances and innovations in healthcare, major unmet needs remain. For some diseases, there is no effective treatment services are inadequate or the treatment is unaffordable and there are still neglected diseases for which little research is done. Moreover, the evolution in healthcare along with economic and social changes 
have led to a, a changing society with new challenges and new unmet needs. Think about antimicrobial resistance, increasing mental health problems, environmental pollution, and pressure on the healthcare budgets. These are all important challenges, but the question is, how did we get there and, and why are there still so many major unmet health-related needs? The current market mechanisms are obviously not providing a solution and may even be the source of some of these challenges. When we look at the pipeline of pharmaceutical trials, for instance, we observe a disbalance between healthcare domains. There is a huge investment in cancer-related treatments, but much less in mental health care, surgery, or liver diseases, for instance. This leads to the exclusion of many patient populations from innovation. Another observation uh, from this study is that there is limited commercial interest beyond drug discovery. Why is there such a selective interest in some domains of health and on pharmaceutical product development. The innovative pharma industry is a for-profit industry. Companies are accountable to their shareholders, therefore they have to identify investments with the highest expected returns on investment. And once an interest in investment uh, or opportunity is identified, research and development is supported, and once a product is ready for the market, it is submitted to the medicines agency, for marketing approval and subsequently to the pricing and reimbursement agency for reimbursement. Even though the initial investment decisions of companies will obviously also depend on the chances of success in the later phases of the development life cycle, there is little steering by the authorities in the beginning of this life cycle. And in that sense, the current pharmaceutical innovation development and appro approval approach remains highly supply driven. The assumption was that this pharmaceutical development framework would lead to a win-win, that the economic benefits and serving, um, and serving people's needs would go hand in hand. But we increasingly see innovations with marginal added benefits for large patient populations, equal to investments with relatively low financial risks. Investments are targeted to areas where there is demand or a demand can be created, but demand is not necessarily equal to priority unmet needs. Because the unmet needs are not identified independent of a specific product in development, authorities have to rely on what the development, uh, developer provides as information regarding unmet needs. Um, and that is another step where it ing increasingly goes wrong. And this is illustrated, for instance, by this, uh, this study, uh, which uh, assessed 216 drugs that entered the German market between 2011 and 2017. The researchers found that for 58% of these drugs, no proof was provided of added benefit over standard of care in terms of patient-relevant outcomes. Yet, these drugs received marketing authorization because they were considered to, be, to do no more harm than good. And several EU member states are subsequently paying for these drugs. There's a trend towards accelerated marketing approval based on lower level of levels of evidence and no requirements with respect to proof of added benefit in terms of patient relevant outcomes compared to the standard of care. These fast approvals based on, for instance, single arm trials or non-randomized trials or surrogate endpoints not only lead to uncertainty regarding the clinical value, but also harm patients and society. There are several scientific papers that demonstrate this or can further illustrate this. And yet, despite this lack of evidence uh, of added benefit in 40 to 60% of the drugs, the study I show you now uh, from a Dutch uh, research group found that companies recoup their investments in three to four years with a little longer time for drugs that are under conditional marketing authorization. So on the one hand, we have negative or non-quantifiable evidence for a significant proportion of the drugs. On the other hand, we have public expenditures that allow companies to offset their initial investments in a relatively short period of time. 
Another point I wanted to raise is that the market-driven approach and focus on pharmaceutical solutions to health problems ignores the potential of other solutions. To illustrate this, um, I'll show you just one example of a pragmatic randomized control trial that was funded by the clinical trials program, the publicly funded trials program, KCE trials, and that investigated two management strategies for irritable bowel syndrome in primary care. So on the one hand, we have the classical therapy, which is uh, um, drug therapy, and on the other hand, the new approach would be a FODMAP diet application on a smartphone. 459 patients with IBS were randomized. Already after four weeks, a significantly higher response rate was observed with the diet app, which persisted during follow-up. And response was also associated with a significant improvement in quality of life, anxiety, and depression compared to the baseline. So therefore, the FODMAP diet uh, should be considered as a first-line treatment for patients with IBS in primary care. Besides these examples, there, there are many more examples that could demonstrate that other solutions for unmet needs like prevention, non-medical interventions, or social care should not be ignored in this entire uh, activity. Also for these other types of solutions, the development and implementation path should be guided by the identified highest patient and societal needs, but this is not what is happening. So what we aim at is a system where unmet patient and societal needs are identified upfront, like the minister said, so that they can be used to define priority needs for research, innovation and policy, which can then be communicated to the research community, including research funders, who steer research to those domains with the high priority needs. The solutions to the unmet needs should not be predetermined. It could be a drug, it could be a device, or it could be any other type of intervention. As soon as the innovation has proven to be safe and to be adding value to society and patients compared to the current standards of care, market access and reimbursement can be decided upon. But why are we not there yet. Um, first, there's currently no common definition of unmet needs, and as unmet needs are not identified, priorities are not set based on identified evidence-based unmet needs. The for-profit rationale, combined with the fact that public authorities are not successful in monetizing health, creates misalignment of innovation with public health needs and inconsistent decisions across decision makers. In other words, there's a knowledge gap that needs to be filled. And the NEED project wants to contribute to filling this gap. The objectives of NEED are to create a framework with criteria for identifying patient and societal unmet needs to inform and support development of more needs-driven healthcare policy and innovation. Our project also aims at assessing the applicability of the NEED uh, approach to rare diseases and finally, the framework was pilot tested in two selected case studies, uh, case uh, health conditions, melanoma and Crohn's disease. The ultimate aim of the NEED project is to create a sustainable initiative to develop, host and maintain an evidence database on unmet patient and societal needs in different health conditions. Our work has led this year in March to four, uh, the publication of four reports, uh, all published on the website of KCE, but also on the website of the NEED project. And I will now pass on the work to Charlene, the principal investigator of the project, uh, to explain you more about the NEED framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irina. I'm very pleased to be able to present to you today one of the key results of the NEED project, namely the NEED assessment framework. To achieve the objectives listed previously by Irina, we have developed a NEED approach which consists of a four-step implementation model 
for conducting research on unmet needs that I will detail in the following slide. The outcome of this process will be the need evidence database accessible to everyone. And then, subsequently, in the appraisal step, stakeholders will evaluate the unmet need data. Policy makers, in particular, will have to examine and weigh up the criteria based on the evidence. To estimate the unmet needs, a four-step implementation model has been developed. Step one is the identification of health condition with potential high unmet need using existing databases and a call for proposals that will invite patient or patient organization, healthcare providers, and the general public to submit health condition with potential high unmet needs. A call for proposal has already been made and the, res the results at the Belgium level will be presented in the next, next slide. Step two is the prioritization and selection of health condition obtained from steps one for the need program research program. Step three is the collection of evidence on the unmet needs criteria following the methods of the need assessment framework. And finally, step four involves the dissemination of the results on the need websites and to the relevant stakeholders. At the start of the year, two calls for proposal were initiated, one at the Belgian level and the other one at the European level. The objective was to identify health condition with potential high unmet needs for the need research program. Two proposals for an in-depth needs analysis will be selected for the next need program research. Nonetheless, the complete list of all submitted topics will be published. In total, 352 responses were, were submitted, almost half concern long COVID. And after removing duplicate, a final list of 112 health conditions with potential high unmet needs was compiled. And the, the screening process of the proposal is currently ongoing. The need assessment framework was developed using two literature reviews, one on patient need and one on societal needs. Consultation with stakeholders and experts and also a Delphi panel with patient organization. Discussion with minister and federal health agency and also many, many internal discussion. As you probably know, there is no consensus on the health-related needs definition. So we prefer using health-related need instead of unmet medical need that is often used in relation to pharmaceutical products. It also avoids confusion with the mainly individual patient needs driven interpretation of unmet medical needs. And there is an agreement among stakeholder, stakeholders that specific criteria should be defined for the assessment of health related patient and societal needs. So we start from the health condition that generate health related needs related to health, for instance, having a good quality of life, health care, for instance, having uh, access to care, and social needs, it means other type of needs, for instance, need for education, need for keeping his job, etc. And this at the level of the patient and of the society, and also in the future. So unmet health related needs corres corresponds to the needs that are not adequately satisfied by the current supply of health, healthcare or social intervention. In other words, they represent the gap between what patient and society need and what is 
to the label or provide it to them. The current need assessment framework has three dimensions, patient, society, and future, and one transversal dimension, which is equity. Within these three dimensions, three domains of needs may emerge. Health needs, healthcare needs, and societal needs. In these three dimensions and three domains, 23 needs criteria have been defined and 43 related indicators to assess whether or not these needs are met. This is another way to present the need assessment framework. So it includes the dimension, for instance, patient needs, then the domain that can be health need, for instance, then the needs criteria, for instance, the impact on the general health quality of life that can then we have the indicators that estimate if the need of health is met or not. Here, this is the average EQ 5D 5 health score. And then we proposed a measurement method, for instance, a patient survey. And finally, the result of the indicators can be presented by a group, for instance, by sex, by age, which represents the equity dimension. 13 criteria have been defined for the dimension of the patient. Five criteria for the health needs, for instance, the impact on the health-related quality of life. Four criteria for the healthcare need, for instance, the effectiveness of the treatment. And four criteria for the societal need, for instance, the impact on work. Eight criteria have been defined for the dimension of the society. Four criteria for the health need, for instance, the frequency of the health condition. Two criteria for the healthcare need, for instance, the effect, the, sorry, for the preventability of the disease. And two criteria for the societal needs, for instance, productivity losses. We also identified two criteria for the future needs, one criterion for the health needs, the future burden of the disease, and one criterion for both healthcare needs and societal needs, the future economic burden of the health condition. And finally, we have the equity dimension. Equity is the distribution of unmet needs among population subgroups for instance, socioeconomic status, and this applies to all dimensions and all domains of the need assessment framework. Finally, to validate the need assessment framework, more particularly the criteria and the indicators included in the, the need assessment framework, a Delphi survey at EU level has been launched. Different experts from various Institute of the EU have been contacted to participate. The first round of the Delphi is ongoing and the publication of the result of the Delphi is expected by January 2025. <coughs> I will now pass the word to Claudia Schoenborn, who is a medical expert at KCE and a crucial member of the NEED team. So I'll be presenting some example results uh, from the two case studies which we carried out. Uh, they focused on Crohn's disease, which is a chronic inflammatory gastrointestinal disease, and on melanoma, which is the most aggressive form of skin cancer. As Charlene just explained, um, in order to identify the unmet needs of the different health condition, we used a multifaceted uh, methodology. This included a disease description from the patient perspective, patient survey and patient interviews, 
for some criteria, we also asked for expert opinion and uh, we re reviewed the scientific literature and public health databases. So the first examples I'm going to show you concern the health needs from a patient perspective. The surveys uh, measured the impact of the different health conditions on patients' quality of life in terms of five different aspects, which were anxiety, depression, pain, discomfort, usual activities, mobility, and self-care. And the graphs show the percentage of respondents who, who said that they had significant problems within these different dimensions. So this provided some information both within the health condition for example, we can see which aspects of the quality of life were most impacted by the disease. Not working, sorry. <laughs> okay. So within Crohn's disease, this was pain discomfort. And for melanoma, it was anxiety and depression. Also, it allowed us to make comparisons across diseases. So in terms of carrying out usual activities, we can see that the disease most impacted Crohn's patients than melanoma patients. So within the patient dimension still, uh, in terms of healthcare needs, some more examples. In terms of the timing within the diagnostic pathway, uh, it was noteworthy that there was a delay between the first consultation that patients had for their symptoms and actually receiving a diagnosis in the case of Crohn's, with 19% of respondents saying that they had to wait for more than one year. This is likely linked uh, to the fact that a diagnosis of Crohn's needs uh, invasive investigations and also still some lacking awareness amongst healthcare professionals. For melanoma, what was noteworthy was the timing between the onset of symptoms and the decision to consult uh, a doctor. So almost half the respondents waited for more than three months. And this is likely linked to still some lacking awareness in terms of the importance of consulting early and some access barriers to dermatologists acting as deterrents. In terms of treatment effectiveness, there were still some important challenges in both diseases. So for Crohn's, there is still insufficient symptom control, reliance on a trial and error approach, and lots of response over time. For melanoma, however, um, the treatment is very effective at early stages, but only moderate in advanced disease and particularly in rare types. The treatment uh, was considered very or extremely burdensome by 18% of Crohn's respondents and by 40% of melanoma respondents. So this is the third uh, dimension still within the patient perspective and it concerns social needs. You can see that uh, for Crohn's disease, uh, more people reported having an impact of the disease on their work. 45% had to reduce work at some point or stop it overall. This was only 20% in the case of melanoma. In terms of financial impact, again, um, we found that Crohn's patients were more impacted by this. It was mainly due to medical expenses and loss of income. Also, more Crohn's patients reported uh, not receiving social support when they had needed it. And this mainly concerned contact with other patients and administrative and social uh, services support. So now we move on to the societal perspective. In terms of health needs, we measured the frequency of the health conditions and their preventability. For Crohn's, there isn't yet uh, uh, an estimate of incidence available in Belgium. So we used the European one, which ranged between 0.4 and 23 per 100,000 population. For melanoma, this was a bit higher at 31 per 100,000 population. To date, there is no primary prevention strategy available for Crohn's disease. In terms of melanoma, however, there is a prim primary prevention is possible through UV exposure reduction campaigns. In terms of the future needs, uh, we measured the future frequency um, but there was no data available for Crohn's. What we know is that the incidence is continuing to increase 
but at a slightly slower rate. And for melanoma, the incidence has been estimated to increase by 11% by 2040 and then to level off. The equity was a transverse dimension and we looked for evidence on that. And we found, for example, that among Crohn's patients, those with a low socioeconomic status had higher hospitalization rates and increased mortality. Among melanoma patients, those with a low socioeconomic status tended to have more advanced stage of diagnosis leading to increased mortality. So uh, we collected this data for two uh, diseases so far, but this is just the beginning of the NEED project. And so the exercise will have to be done for many more diseases. And this has some considerations. First of all, uh, some of the tools will have to be slightly adapted uh, to capture measures for other types of diseases, such as pediatric and acute diseases. Secondly, um, in order to be used in policy-making decisions, in order to uh, prioritize actions, um, the rating of unmet needs will have to be carried out. And we will in the future work on a transparent and scientific manner of doing this. Thirdly, the unmet needs change over time because of new developments, new treatments, resistance to treatments, and so the data will have to be updated regularly. And finally, it will be necessary to collect the data across different EU countries, both in order to populate the database more rapidly and to achieve bigger sample sizes, which is particularly relevant uh, in the case of rare diseases. So all of this information will feed into what we call the NEED database, which will be freely available to all. And this is an example of what it might look like. Um, so users will be able to filter the information by health condition, um, by region, by age group of the affected population. And also, as you see, um, as shown by the different colors, there will be a rating of the different unmet needs. For each indicator, there will also be more detailed information available. As you can see here, these are the experience uh, burden of physical symptoms related to Crohn's disease. So this concludes the part um, on the case studies and on the NEED database. So I will pass the microphone to Isabel Hess, who will talk about the applicability of the framework to rare diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So my name is Isabel Heus. I'm from the KU Leuven. And together with my team of researchers, the KCE team, and as well as several other stakeholders, we investigated how the NEED framework could be tailored to capture the unmet needs of patients with a rare condition. Because indeed, the NEED framework needs to recognize the distinct characteristics of persons with rare conditions. That includes the heterogeneous nature of it, the complexity very often, but also the complexity of the diagnostic pathway, the limited number of persons to a rare disease condition. And the NEED framework was revisited in that way to allow for a multidimensional assessment of the unmet needs. And more in particular, we investigated several aspects of it. We investigated the methods that are used to capture, to collect the data from the patients to understand their needs. And we also revisited the criteria that actually characterize the unmet needs of persons, actually the evidence that needs to be collected to understand the needs of these patients. And actually we emphasize that uh, in this way to do this assessment, a very active engagement with key stakeholders is crucial. So with patients, patient organizations, physicians, healthcare providers, researchers, industry, European reference networks, and many others. Um, the different criteria that were presented um, just by Charlene were hence um, revisited and let's have a look at the ones that are characterized for the patient. So for the patient needs, um, three different new additional criteria were identified based on the research that we did that focused on uh, the needs in rare diseases. And these are indicated here in red. 
So the toll on the psychological level, such as a low self-esteem, is often very profound and can exert a really important negative influence on the individual's mood. So that's why we also included that. And then the unpredictability of the rare diseases themselves and the symptoms related to this also introduces a lot of uncertainty for these people in terms of the trajectory that the illness will take in the future, but also in terms of the implications of their diseases for them in the future. And although some of these criteria uh, are also applicable for common diseases, we found it very important to indicate this as well here. Um, in terms of the other criteria with respect to the societal needs, we also identified certain specific criteria. For instance, here the impact of caregivers, which might be also tremendously in terms of isolation that they may um, perceive. But also many other characteristics are um, typical for rare diseases. Things of, think of the criteria related to uh, diagno diagnosis. So, for instance, the time spent to diagnosis, or for instance, also the efforts that it takes to have a final diagnosis, or for instance, the number of misdiagnoses that these people face with rare conditions, and as well as the high number of doctor visits that are needed in order to come to a final diagnosis. So all that actually is something that is typical for rare diseases, and not to forget as well several criteria that can be linked to um, patients that still lack a diagnosis uh, of their rare disease if, if only have a, part, a partial diagnosis of their disease. So what we did is actually not only revisiting the criteria, but also revisiting the indicators and the methods that are used to collect the data on all these aspects. And that brings me indeed to this slide, the methods. So the methodological challenges when you want to collect data on the unmet needs from a patient population um, that actually um, is actually very small. So one of the challenges is related to the recruitment. So there might be limited possibilities to access or to reach the patients because sometimes they are really completely invisible. They do not speak up always. There is not always a patient organization available that actually potentially could speak up in their place. And these patients um, might also live very disper dispersed uh, across Europe. Um, and all that may be important and may lead uh, in terms of research to, to potentially biases. Um, another aspect is related to the uh, getting a representative sample uh, of such patients that complicates actually the research. And this is due to the heterogeneity of um, the sample and as well as the country specific uh, variations of care that is offered and we also heard this from Anemi, uh, specific variations of care that is offered at, um, in the different countries. Um. And other aspects are just for instance the lack of a validated survey instruments to measure particular very important characteristics like for instance quality of life. We have heard also from Charlene that the current need framework uh, works with the generic, the generic questionnaire, the E25D. But um, for rare diseases, not all specific needs of these persons are captured by that specific generic questionnaire. So we are lacking specific questionnaires. So that's really important to understand and to do this. And then we have difficulties in terms of group analysis due to the fact that we work with underpowered studies and that may influence the robustness of the studies and hence the, yeah, the, the, the results that come out of it and the application of it. And then a very last important um, challenge in terms of methodology is the incompleteness and also the unavailability of data and data sources that are useful, that are available, that contain data of high quality that can be used um, for further research. In the need framework, there is a burden of disease a database that can be used. However, um, that does not focus or does not include um, rare diseases. So additional databases are urgently needed. And there the Orphanet database is extremely valuable. Um, and also several other databases and registers, for instance, the European Commission's community registry on orphan medicinal products and others that um, actually um, are sources that we should focus also on. 
So in this, based on that research, we came to the conclusion that a well-designed recruitment strategy is key to uh, conduct a need assessment and to be inclusive for rare diseases. That actually makes use of different types of materials, um, paper-based materials for recruitment, patient-based materials, but also online materials. That actually involves also different types of organizations. Think of disease-specific reference networks, European um, reference networks, um, healthcare professional associations, patient organizations, but also the community pharmacists, and also self-help groups, and many other groups that may reach out to these patients. And also to use different types of channel channels to reach these patients, not only just via email, but also using social media and indeed these interest groups or in-person consultations. So we need to apply a mixed method approach. Only by using a database in order to find data from patients will not help in this context. So we need also to talk with these patients via interviews to listen to them, to listen to their journey. And actually, as we have heard our now today as well by enemy, that as a starting point, um, maybe organize also a focus group discussion, attending patient days and uh, or combining this with survey. And then being very transparent. Transparent about the fact that it is a challenge to anonymize this data because there is always a risk for re-identification and that we are transparent to the patients in informed consent, for instance, um, with, uh, in, with this type of research. We have limitations on the methodologies for that. So the need approach, taking care of um, the recommendations that we give here, is now inclusive also to identify the needs of patients that suffer and persons that suffer from a rare condition. The call for proposals um, actually will take specific designs and will adopt a several channels in order to be very inclusive. Databases, that's something that we need to work on all together to try to collect and feed these databases in order to make it possible to collect as much as possible uh, the needs of patients and the trans transversal needs. With respect to the ethical and the legal database protection, I also um, indicated the challenges and we hope that the European health data space may offer here a solution. So updating the META database, ac making it as accessible, making it visible, that's what we do today, but also making it useful to inform decisions is crucial. And what the MEAT framework will do is to ensure that no patient in this way is left behind. That's the key. Thank you for your attention today. Closing words. I would like to close this presentations, these presentations on the NEED project by saying that we are convinced that the NEED approach could support decision making processes regarding policy priorities and scientific innovations. And it can help to uh, reduce suboptimal resource allocation uh, and by this increase population's health and well being. We are actually not the first ones to think about this. There are several, several reports from the WHO and of the panel of the future of science and technology of the European Parliament, uh, who have also highlighted the need to transform the current system. For example, Mariana Mazzucato, who is the chair of the WHO Council of the Economics of Health for All, called for action to rethink the current economic narrative of healthcare stating that states can move from reactively fixing market failures to proactively shaping markets that prioritize human and planetary health. The STOA reports from the uh, European Parliament, um, there is one on improving access to medicines and promoting pharmaceutical innovation that proposes measures to incentivize R&D in domains of high unmet medical needs, for instance, antimicrobials and uh, diseases with extremely low prevalence. 
the European Pharmaceutical R&D report um, proposes to establish a European medicines infrastructure that focuses on areas that are under investigated under the current business model. And the cost of non-Europe in health policy report investigates areas where joint EU health policy could have added value in terms of economic and societal benefits, referring to aspects such as quality of life, absenteeism, and carbon and environmental impact of the healthcare sector, which are actually all criteria which are also included in the need framework. So what can we do to support all these activities and initiatives and take the plans forward? The NEED team recommends to set up an independent research structure for unmet needs, um, to coordinate research uh, into unmet needs and support the development of unmet ne an unmet needs database. This structure could be an independent research infrastructure or it could, it could be embedded in existing programs but it should be responsible for standardizing procedures for unmet needs research, provide advice, training, and support to unmet needs, re needs researchers uh, on how to collect data on unmet needs, and also be responsible for maintaining and updating the database of unmet needs. And collaboration will be key. There are already several established initiatives that provide information that provide input that could be useful for this kind of database, but they are all very fragmented. Um, for instance, for health information, there is a European health information portal. Also many academic research groups have data or can provide data, collect data. Uh, for the innovation procurement initiatives, we see, yeah, I only highlight a few here, but there are many more that are focusing on innovation pro procurement and are, all, are also looking at unmet needs. And for the governance structure, we think we can get some inspiration from existing structures like the ECDC, the in uh, in International Horizon Scanning Initiative, Benelixa, and so on. Um, international collaboration uh, with decision makers or liaison with decision makers will also be cru crucial to make sure that the work performed by the research uh, structure is relevant for decision making processes. So I'm, th I'm thinking about the European Medicines Agency, the HK coordination group, the INCAPR, but also research funders, patient associations and stakeholders, because without collaboration and coordination at the EU level, fragmentation of initiatives will continue to exist and, um, and markets um, will not be reshaped in the way that we want them to. So we want them to be patient-centered and needs-oriented. And with that, I would like to close this part of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Irina, do come and sit next to me. Uh, and thank you for a brilliant presentation, uh, encapsulating all that work, the richness of the work you have done uh, incredibly briefly and succinctly and clearly. Uh, time for questions later. We already have a number of them coming in, so we'll come back to that shortly. But we wanted to get a couple of different perspectives on this issue. So joining our discussion now, and he's going to make a short presentation, First, I'm delighted to welcome Jasper Gleisen, who is Coordinating Policy Advisor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Affairs and Medical Technology at the Dutch Ministry of Health. Very warm welcome. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, should I scratch? For the next, ah, there we go. That's my first slide. This one I recognize. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and first of all, my, my real uh, warm uh, and, and heartfelt congratulations to the NEED team for all your excellent work. I think it's a really nice uh, way to start off this conversation today uh, with all of you. Um, so I'm here uh, on behalf of the Department of Pharmaceutical Affairs at the Dutch Ministry of Health. Uh, and I was asked to share a little bit uh, on our policy work um, that touches a bit on this discussion uh, related to unmet medical needs. Uh, my presentation is, is titled Gaps in, uh, in Drug Development, um, and uh, I will focus specifically on the role of pharmaceutical interventions 
uh, in the discussion of unmet medical need, uh, also being part of the uh, Department of Pharmaceutical Affairs, that's one of our main focuses. Um, so the question that I uh, want to pose to you and, and sort of ask you to keep in mind during my presentation is uh, the one uh, that is shown here, and that is uh, if society is clear about what medicines it needs and, and what is willing to pay for them. Uh, and this is really a question that uh, we try to uh, keep in mind with a lot of the policy development uh, that we work on. Uh, and we really started uh, uh, to work on this in a bit more in-depth uh, about five years ago in 2019. Um, when we noticed that uh, medicine development uh, has really gotten a lot more complex. Um, there are many different parties are involved. It's, it's no longer the case that, that one company does the initial discovery and then brings the compound all the way through pharmaceutical development. Um, but many, many parties are involved. Uh, and uh, in combination with the complexity of the players, uh, we also saw a complexity of the financial system that surrounds pharmaceutical development. So it's not just different parties that are involved, but it's also different types of financial transactions that take place along the development pathway. Um, and so we started out uh, those five years ago with the question, can we create a better understanding uh, of this financial ecosystem uh, that surrounds the development of medicines to really uh, kick off a more fact-based uh, discussion so we would have a level playing field to know what we were all talking about. Um, and this uh, has resulted in a, in a series of reports that the Dutch government commissioned um, and I want to briefly touch upon all of these three uh, before I progress. So um, moving from left to right, uh, the, the, the one on the left is really the most comprehensive of the, of the three uh, and really dives very deeply uh, into this question that I just posed. And that is, you know, what, what does this financial ecosystem that surrounds pharmaceutical development really look like? And, and I'm actually delighted that, that one of the, the lead authors uh, on this report, uh, Saskia van der Erf, is, is also here. And she will talk about the results of this study later today. That also excuses me from, from diving too much into details here. She can uh, pick that up later this afternoon. Um, and then after this report, uh, the second one, uh, which was also done by, by Saskia's uh, firm, uh, focused on the question, okay, so if we understand how the financial ecosystem operates, uh, can we then also uh, assess which uh, results actually come out of this system? So we asked her to map uh, which pharmaceutical products were actually developed for a series uh, of, of uh, high impact diseases over the last 25 years. Uh, and then the third report, uh, we actually um, having that really fact uh, and, and quantitative basis for discussion, uh, looked a bit more at the qualitative aspects to see if we can determine where uh, the greatest needs are for pharmaceutical de development. So uh, focusing again on this, on this first report, uh, I just briefly want to highlight some of the main conclusions. Uh, the first one is that, that really that pharmaceutical R&D is, is really a multi-stakeholder market and it's increasingly complex and it's really sizable. So about 300 billion uh, a year global market uh, that we're talking about. Um, and that even though that, that public funding is, is really essential and, and very important, uh, especially in uh, early discovery, uh, we also have to acknowledge that private investment really drives drug development in the, in the later stages uh, and is a bigger chunk uh, of the pie that's actually required for this pharmaceutical development. Um, and as a cause of this uh, and this high uh, expense for drug development, what we see is that uh, a medicine's expected financial return uh, really ultimately drives whether it's developed uh, uh, up to launch. So if there's no incentive, no financial incentive to, to develop such medicines, uh, companies simply make other, uh, other decisions. Um, and they're uh, primarily driven uh, in this decision making uh, by our willingness to pay. So in the end, it's the, the global governments and, and insurance companies and their willingness to pay for new drugs that really uh, influences these decisions that are being made. Um, now, uh, w when we talk about drug development, uh, we talk very much uh, about an ecosystem now. So we don't really focus that much anymore on, on single parties, but we look at the whole ecosystem and what the output is of the combined work of all these players. Um, and these players can be roughly combined into three categories. So first there's the public actors. So you can think of universities, uh, hospitals, public funding bodies. Uh, then there's the private sector, uh, of course, the companies involved, ranging from startups, biotech, large pharmaceutical companies, but also many of the contract research organizations that play a key role. Uh, and then the third category uh, being uh, the investors, uh, ranging from small to large and institutional investors, but also the type of transactions uh, that you see in this space. Uh, you can have uh, initial public offerings to raise money and capital, but you can also think of, of merger, uh, mergers and uh, acquisition procedures. Uh, 
Now, knowing that this, this uh, system is there and that it's complex, so uh, we ask the question, uh, what does it actually cost for this financial ecosystem and the players involved to, to successfully develop one medicine? Uh, and I know that there's a body of literature out there uh, that has tried to take a swing at this. Um, I think we came up uh, with a number of uh, very comparable price ranges. Um, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a complex figure, but I'll, I'll try to briefly talk you through it. So uh, the, the top of the three lines uh, shows what it would cost uh, to basically bring one new drug from start to finish through all the development phases, assuming that they're all successful uh, at the first dose. So then, you know, if you add this up, and of course it's, it's varied based on, on product type, but you come in a range of about 300 million uh, US dollars, uh, this is, for one drug development. Um, but, but keeping this, this sort of ecosystem uh, thinking in mind, you also have to account for all the failures uh, that within the ecosystem uh, will also take place because drug development, as you I'm sure all know, is very complex. It's a high risk endeavor. So not all compounds reach the finish line. So if, if you take the failures into account, the ecosystem will have to pay a, a much larger sum of money. So one new drug costs in the range of one and a half billion uh, US dollars. Um, and then there's a third factor that, that many people often forget is that uh, in our world money is not free, which means that a type of uh, premium has to be paid for taking out loans to reward investors, etc. Uh, and because of the lengthy period of drug development, so typically 10 to 15 years, uh, this really adds up uh, to the cost of drug development. So, so typically this can account up to about half the cost uh, to develop a new drug. So then all of a sudden we're in the three billion uh, uh, dollar range to develop one new drug to market. So coming back to this uh, uh, conclusion that I showed on a previous slide, you know, like the system is very financially driven and driven by uh, our willingness to pay, uh, this, this to a large extent makes sense because yes, medicine development is very expensive. Uh, and it is true that a single success has to compensate for the failures that are present uh, within the system. Uh, but I think an important thing that we should not forget is that in the end, this, this to pay for the success is, is uh, a payment that we all, uh, we all make uh, as public uh, uh, health insurance uh, uh, takers, uh, of, of public bodies, of governments that, that fund our healthcare systems. So that, that does raise the question, you know, if, if in the end, uh, we're the ones that pay uh, for this entire ecosystem, uh, do we get what we want from the system? Uh, is, it, is it catering to our needs, so to say? Uh, and I think that ties very nicely to the topic of today of under medical need. Um, and, and here I wanna uh, show you one of the uh, nice pieces of data that was uh, put forward in the first report. Uh, and what you see here is an analysis of investment behavior of a series of 10 venture capital funds based both in Europe uh, and in the United States. Uh, and venture capital funds play really a key role in making uh, critical investments at a, at a very high risk stage of pharmaceutical development, typically where they bring products to first uh, clinical development, first proof of in-man uh, efficacy. Uh, and, and if you look at the, the areas where they focus their investment, you can see this highly skewed uh, towards oncology here on the left, um, whereas many other uh, very high impact areas uh, are, are underserved. And although in the right you see psychiatry, OBGYN, uh, dermatology, for instance. And it's, 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 it's quite striking that uh, our uh, willingness to pay, because this is a key factor uh, that venture capital funds take into account for making their investments, uh, provides us a skewed uh, investment pattern. And, and I think it's important that we have a discussion about this. Oh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to speed up apparently. Uh, so two questions. So um, uh, the first one is, does society know what medicine costs? Uh, or what medicine it needs most. Uh, and as a policymaker, I want to stress that I find this a difficult uh, discussion to have be because I think it's very much a public uh, and a political discussion that needs to be had. Uh, and and uh, uh, initiatives such as a need uh, project can be a very helpful tool. Um, so I wanna briefly touch upon a number of policy objectives that the Netherlands has put in place uh, for public medicine R&D. So one is it's important to keep uh, uh, funding basic research uh, secondly, uh, if you do basic research and fund medicine development, try to focus on medicines of uh, areas of unmet medical need. So recently we focused both on antibiotic development uh, as well as clinical development for therapy-resistant depression. Um, and third, uh, because we still need companies, uh, when we do license out publicly developed uh, intellectual property, uh, it's important to think about the terms that you can place here on these licensees. So what we have done is that we developed a framework uh, including a number of legal terms 
for public bodies such as universities to form contracts with uh, uh, companies so that the public interest is guaranteed when publicly developed IP is developed into products uh, by the private industry. And if we uh, then move this towards a more European perspective, uh, I think these are important things to consider uh, because the Dutch market is quite small, so as a government we cannot provide sufficient tool uh, to do this on our own. So we need a collective uh, discussion on this. So can we provide a, a uh, definition of unmet medical needs together that can steer public research funds? Uh, and an example <laughs> where we can learn uh, is for instance the EU uh, Beating Cancer Plan. Uh, so an initiative such as this, uh, what's its use for? Has this given us the right results? Uh, and thirdly, uh, can we also create a level playing field by introducing such uh, terms for licensing contracts at a more European level? Uh, because I think we need a level playing field for this. Uh, so the second sorry, part. It's going to yeah. have to be really quick now. <laughs> sorry, I want to leave time. There are lots of questions coming in. I know. I, I will try to wrap up. Uh, so the second part is uh, of the question uh, Does society also know what it's willing to pay for medicine that it wants? Uh, and I think this is also quite a complicated uh, discussion. Uh, and, and here, uh, I think it's important to also collaborate uh, because if in the Netherlands we put a signal into the market that we have a certain type of financial value for a product, uh, we need to do this together because the Dutch market in itself is too small to drive pharmaceutical development. Um, and an important uh, uh, thing to consider here uh, is that the political horizon to make such a commitment is typically much shorter than that of drug development. So we need to have a balance between these two. So then I will wrap up with my final slide uh, and, and leave you with uh, our key policy goal. Uh, and that is, can we move from a supply-driven pharmaceutical ecosystem to a more demand-driven one? Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed, Jasper. And lots to come back to uh, in our discussion in a moment. But to complete the picture with a reflection from an HTA expert, delighted to welcome Roisin Adams, the Head of Strategy and External Engagement at the National Center for Pharma Economics. Very good to have you with us, Roisin. Over to you. Thanks for the invite to speak here. Um, I also want to commend KCE. I think this is an incredibly important piece of work and something that is, has been quite elusive to, to capture in, in, um, prior to this. But it is a topic that we have been, that arises in, in, in much of our work and I would say particularly within health technology assessment and I am tasked with being chair of the newly established uh, member state led HTA coordination group which will oversee EU HTA uh, for, for technologies, both medicines and medical devices. This is the, the structure, but I was, I was struck by some of the thoughts and I thought it was a very nice, um, when I heard Jasper referring to willingness to pay, of course, willingness to pay is something we think about a lot within health technology assessment. And particularly when I come from the Irish perspective where we use cost effectiveness. And, and that is fundamental in, in trying to understand what are we willing to pay for the amount of benefit that we get. Under the European HTA, what we'll do is we'll try and synthesize the evidence on technologies that, that manufacturers do bring, the health technology developers are bringing, and try to synthesize that to make it available across Europe. That will then feed back in to national decision frameworks in trying to understand, okay, is there enough benefit here for what we're willing to pay? But of course, that fundamental question, what are we willing to pay? <laughs> and that's, that's where we talk about thresholds, and I know in Ireland we do have an established threshold for an amount of benefit. But uh, it's different around Europe. Some people have different decision-making frameworks around that. I won't go into this in too much detail, but the, the EU HTA coordination group will oversee a body of work where we will produce joint clinical assessments, and that is that synthesis on products that will be licensed, but also we will look much earlier at joint scientific consultations. So we will talk to health technology developers and we will discuss what their plans are in relation to development of, of, of products. Um, and that's where we get into the detail of does it look like the evidence um, paradigm is going to incorporate uh, the outcomes that will address some of these unmet needs? So that's, that's a very important discussion to have early. And then another really important aspect within the, the EU HTA 
um, framework will be emerging health technologies. What products are coming our way? Are they likely to address the needs that perhaps have been defined by society? We have been, uh, when, I, when I quickly went through the HTA regulation, unmet need is mentioned a lot. It's mentioned in how we want to potentially expand our work under the EU HTA. And I can say now, given that we're just trying to build a system, perhaps it, it isn't at the fore of our mind how we expand it further. But it is a really important aspect of, can we, can we use this as a, as a guiding light, if you like, as to the, the direction it goes? And that's why I think the work in, in KCE is so important, be it at the beginning, but it's really important to start to examine this now because we have been tasked with this within the regulation. And in fact, it will come into the pharmaceutical, obviously the pharmaceutical package as well. So it is really important that we start to look at this early. The specific areas I think that are really key to look at is, is the emerging health technologies, because that allows us um, space, if you like, to examine what is coming our way, but more importantly, what is not coming our way, <laughs> if you like. Um, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to give you a perspective from Ireland, we have a cost effectiveness framework, which of course examines added benefit through benefit towards quality of life alongside the cost that we're willing to pay. And we have an established threshold which is ultimately our willingness to pay. I won't say we always stick to that threshold, and that's where some of the challenges come in. Sorry, this has jumped around a bit. Um, we, within our, in Ireland, we have, within our legislation, we have clinical need mentioned as, so it's not quite unmet need, but it is a clinical need, which is established um, for the, for the payers in Ireland, that they have to consider this in uh, choosing to um, add a drug to our reimbursement list. And that's, that's really important. Um, we see unmet medical need mentioned a lot in dossiers that we get from health technology developers, because of course it is a criteria that they almost have to address. But ultimately we're, we're considering it at a product level. And I think what's really nice about the work here is that we're now starting to step back a little bit more and look at this more globally. Are we actually addressing the needs? Because, of course, as, as Irina said in some of her opening slides, in many cases, we're not actually getting added benefit for what we pay. And that leads into the whole area of opportunity cost. We have lost, um, we have lost healthcare if we do pay for um, units of benefit that that never transpire. And that's, I think that's really key, the opportunity cost. Um, I'm very happy to see that we have a framework now from which to start with, because this is a really difficult topic. Um, but at least we start to acknowledge um, that if we don't tackle this at, at a broader level, we will actually um, uh, have a huge opportunity cost. And this is one of the challenges that we're facing, um, certainly for pharmaceuticals at the moment, but maybe also in time through uh, medical devices. I want to say a little bit about uh, horizon scanning, because I think this is really key and the, the future, if you like. It's looking out into that horizon. What have we got coming? Will it address what we need to see? But most importantly, what does it not address? So can that be used as a tool? And I know Irina mentioned um, IC as one of the initiatives that start to look at this a little bit more carefully, but what are the missing pieces here that we have limited investment? And can we bring that into the, the, the debate on where, where we should be directing um, investment? So I do see it as a really key enabler of, of how we can um, progress, if you like. That is my last slide, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the questions that we will have, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much. So, lots of questions already coming in, and I'm going to dive straight into them in the interest of time, because we only have about 10 minutes left uh, in this session. A couple of very practical questions. Uh, one in terms of 
uh, the database and how we're going to populate it. Uh, Delphine Heenan saying, will the database, the need database, only be filled out by the KCE or will this be a collaborative endeavor? <laughs> Who would like to pick up on that? Irina. Yes, for sure, it will be a collaborative endeavor. It's, it's impossible to do it as one institution. So the idea that we would have is that to uh, populate the database indeed a little bit more quickly is to collaborate with, uh, for instance, academic institutions European-wide um, and, uh, and, and, and make a structure that can guide the processes, the scientific processes to collect the data so that we can be sure that the information included in the database is, is valid and reliable for the decision makers. So I think that is key. I think it's not possible to just open the database and let everyone who wants to put in the data. I think there should be some kind of quality control first mm -hmm. by an independent agency to see whether the state of the art or the standardized procedures for the unmet needs research have been used. But it should be a collaboration, yeah. that's for sure. And hence that emphasis already that's been put on building the EU's role in building that infrastructure, in getting that standardized approach, getting it right, and then encouraging everybody uh, to follow those guidelines exactly. to populate it. Thank you very much. A question linked to rare diseases from Pedro Fasson, saying for rare diseases, additional criteria, you mentioned this, Isabel, uh, like stigma or reproductive health are identified. Aren't these generally applicable? <laughs> Indeed, uh, I think I also mentioned this. So um, by doing that research, we identified additional criteria and several of them are indeed also very relevant for other diseases, common diseases, like for instance, this uh, aspect on reproductive uh, reproductivity. For instance, can people get, uh, keep get, getting children, for instance, when they suffer from a particular condition? It's not unique to rare diseases can also be linked to other diseases. So That's this true. And this is added indeed now to the criteria list of the of the meat database. So and this will be, as you add more and more diseases, a sort of iterative process where you look at one specific area and specific set of needs and that leads to new thinking about the others. It should work. You just speak. He'll pick it up works. on who you are. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. So currently, the this is an ongoing process. I mean, so as I explained, we just started the Delphi panel. And so we included, for instance, the, the indicators and the criteria proposed by uh, by the by Isabel and her, her team. And so, of course, this is an ongoing and we will probably update it. And as I said, published an updated version of the framework in uh, in the coming months yeah so yes it's uh, an ongoing and Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a broader question here from Maximilian Salcher Conrad, who says, does the framework include an approach for ranking or comparing needs across conditions? Uh, currently no, it's not. It's so the framework is really meant to collect the scientific evidence related to the unmet needs. Uh, so the database also will provide the evidence and um, the farthest we would go as researchers would be assign um, severity score, something or, or mm. lights to the different criteria for each disease, but the across disease comparisons, there are a lot of value judgments to me be made, for instance, regarding the relative importance of the different criteria and that is something for which there is no scientific right or wrong answer. So that is a, a political process that has to be, that has to take place. So the, the really the weighing of the different criteria in the assessment of the eventual level of unmet need in a specific disease, that's actually a political process and we cannot inform that. Thank you. We'll continue with the factual questions and then we'll have a quick broader discussion, I hope. Uh, one here uh, from Eva Schutters from Rare Diseases Belgium saying, is this methodology truly the right one to make the unmet needs of 6,300 known rare diseases visible within a reasonable time frame? So an enormous amount of work, an enormous range of diseases. What, what time frame are we looking at? What is realistic? That's indeed a very difficult question, actually. And uh, th therefore, there is true collaboration needed across Europe via different institutions. 
um, and leads to um, to do different and, and meet studies in different areas. We have also been thinking about how to do this per disease area, per different type of disease, but indeed in the context of rare diseases, uh, very often there is no name for a particular hair condition, so there might be shared symptoms and so forth, um, upon which we can also try to capture more, more diseases, but indeed that's a, that's a very mm. relevant question. How fast can we collect the needs of many um, patients with rare diseases, but also this is also something true for other diseases. There I was going to say other I diseases out, yeah. there out there. So how can we can collect all these needs in one database as fast as possible? It's a very long trajectory that we have started here. It's ambitious, mm. but it needs to start somewhere. It needs to be updated all the time. And, and on the start somewhere, Claudia, why Crohn's and melanoma? Why those two case studies first? Why were they chosen? <laughs> We have now developed uh, a methodology to actually prioritize the next conditions that are going to be studied. But to start with, we hadn't yet developed that. So it was um, a decision based on existing databases with high unmet needs. Um, and so we actually didn't want to choose one of the conditions in which everybody knows that there are very obvious high unmet needs, right. for example, diseases with very high fatality. Uh, and so we wanted to look for something for diseases in which we could expect some high unmet needs, yeah. but which weren't that obvious. So more of a challenge, therefore, to test the framework yes. for how it, how it can deal with complexity. That's correct. They don't necessarily represent the two diseases which we thought out of all diseases would be the ones with the highest unmet Thank needs. Thank you. And Irina, you talked earlier about how this sits in the framework of other work that's been done as well. Uh, and someone asking um, truly impressive work, says uh, Milka Sokolovic, uh, but says, I'd like to know if and how the need project relates to the OECD's Paris patient reported indicator surveys. Yeah, I think um, indeed. That, so the, the Paris survey is actually, I think, one of the possible um, data sources that we could use to to assess unmet needs in specific diseases. So that is a little bit what I was trying to say. There are many initiatives on data collection, collection of health information that is out there and that can be useful to for this objective, for identifying unmet needs. Uh, but you need some kind of central structure that tries to identify all these individual initiatives and, and yeah, fragmented initiatives very often and mm -hmm. try to collaborate with them to get uh, the most uh, useful information out of these. Yeah. Thank you. And there are two questions relating to the pharmaceutical package. We're going to come back specifically on the issue of public funding for research uh, and on that whole financial ecosystem uh, question that Jasper raised so eloquently earlier. We're going to come back on the role of incentives uh, later. But just briefly, therefore, for this one, a uh, question from Lars Stollenwerk. Uh, UMN and HUMN are a key part of the pharmaceutical package, w w which will impact incentives and regulatory support. How do you see this complementing the need framework? Uh, and a European, somebody from the European Society of Cardiology saying, how will the results of need guide incentives and public framework with respect to the parallel definition? So we come back to this definitional question in the pharmaceutical legislation. Um, I don't know whether, Jasper, this is something you could pick up on. <laughs> Thanks for passing the complicated <laughs> question to me. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think from a bigger perspective, we're really happy that there's such a strong place for under medical need in the, in the pharmaceutical legal package that is now under consideration. Um, so we really look forward to sort of having a more detailed discussion on, on the definition. And I, I think it really uh, strikes true that uh, this definition is a key point. Uh, and we're, we're very much willing to discuss tying incentives yeah. to that. So the Dutch position on this has also uh, been that this is important and, and we feel that this should be put forward. Uh, but how to define it is, is, is really difficult and, and for a definition such as that, I think an initiative such as the NEED project is, is really key. Uh, so I'm very happy that it's now published and we can have more detailed debates on it like we're having it today. 
got you. Um, a question about your selection. We go back to that question of how you choose what to work on next. Uh, saying, would it be interesting to, to test the framework on a disease that would be rather well served, just to assess the framework and its objectives, i.e. almost using it as a control, I think, is the suggestion. Um, or do we really need to focus on those areas, given the vast work that this involves, we really need to go straight into identifying those areas with the highest unmet needs. Who, yeah. <laughs> well, out of the two diseases that we chose, actually, I think we did, uh, in a sense, one of the diseases uh, didn't have as much high unmet needs in certain areas than the other one. Um, but I think also given the time and the resources that it takes to gather all this data, it, uh, I'm not quite sure whether it would be worth uh, having yeah. a kind of control um, disease. So we really need to prioritize, be given the time it takes for each, each disease. Um, we are almost out of time for this session, um, but I did want to bring back Anne, if I might. Anne, you've been watching the presentations, listening to the discussion, lots of questions coming in, touched on many of them. We'll come back on others of them uh, later on because some very much link to the topics of our next panels. But Anne, your reflections on what you've heard. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for a very wonderful and interesting session. And it made me think of all the policy documents that um, many of you and, and I have read over the last decades, and they all start with saying, well, we want to put the patient in the middle. We want to put the patient in the center, and then they quickly move on talking about the system. And I think this need framework is actually really putting the patient in the center. So I, I would like to ask everybody to take this opportunity and put our money where our mouth is and really put this into practice by collaborating. And I think this will be key to make this happen. We will have to collaborate between stakeholders, researchers, patient organizations, uh, citizens, regulatory bodies, but obviously also between EU countries because this is impossible to do um, in one country by itself. It will always be a work in progress. It will never be finished. Needs will shift and change, so we will always have to be working on this in addition to an existing paradigm that is the push, but we also need to provide the pull. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to start doing that. 